on my screen and then we'll be good to go. Okay. All right, so everybody should be looking at my screen. We have, um, tonight we're going, we're going to go over some of the, um, some of the, the points that you all hopefully have already read through in chapter three. That is our basic botany class for Extension Master Gardeners. So we've got several objectives tonight. Um, but the main thing we are going to focus on is understanding the main roles of leaves, roots, stems, and flowers, okay? Um, once we get through that, we're going to look at some of the ways that environment influences plant growth. And then to wrap things up, we're going to talk a little bit about taxonomy and uh, classification of plants, which really is my favorite part probably taxonomy and identification, but unfortunately um, that is not what we get to focus the majority of our efforts on tonight. So what we're going to get is a little introduction to all of these areas. And I'm sure you've probably already learned this. I'm not sure how many classes y'all have had yet. Um, I, am I the first one? No, I surely not. Yeah, this, <laughs> I is our third, this is our third week, Celeste. Oh, okay. Good. So y'all are going to, you're probably catching the drift by now that each session is just touching the iceberg on the tips of many different topic areas. And that's going to be up to you as master gardeners after your educational course is finished to pick which areas interest you the most and delve into those. And that is where you're going to acquire your um, you know, continued education hours and, and grow as a gardener yourself. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So with that being said, I'm gonna start out with a question. So why do we care about botany? <laughs> You're probably thinking, okay, I just wanna to get to the vegetable gardening or I just wanna to get to the landscape design or you know, something that feels really tangible that you can put your hands on um, and get into. But before we can get to some of those topics, it is so important for us to have a solid foundation um, and, and basic you know, knowledge of basic botany is going to help us lay that firm foundation. So I have a, I put a picture up here and I just want to tell y'all, while I am myself am not opposed to displaying botanical illustrations as art form on my walls in my house, which I have done, but I won't take you over there to show you. <laughs> there must be more to botany than modern design trends, right? I know you go into Target, you go into wherever, and you're seeing all of these beautiful botanical illustrations used as art. But if you actually take a few minutes and really examine these drawings, you will actually be more the wiser. They, if they are good, botanic illustrations, not botanic drawings, but botanic illustrations, they are going to meticulously um, illustrate to us leaf, stem, flower, and even root structures. And what did I say were going to be some of our main points that we're talking about tonight? learning about leaf, stem, roots, and flowers. So these botanical illustrations really have not only beauty, but knowledge in them. And so that, my friends, are where we are going to start our talk today. So let's define botany. I looked through <clears throat> our chapter that we have in the Master Gardener book, and it doesn't actually give you a definition of botany. <laughs> which may be a big fail on our part, but at the same time, I hope you have caught the drift that sim botany, simply put, is the study of plants, right? We're learning, we're studying about plants. So how is this knowledge of botany going to help me be a better gardener is what we're asking ourselves, right? That's really why we should care about botany. How is this gonna help us? So what we're gonna do before we get in to the particulars is uh, look at a few examples, okay? Oh, I'm getting my controls mixed up here. Um, there we go, now it worked. <laughs> I kept clicking and clicking. 
So this is, you may be thinking, well, this is a strange picture to start a botany talk with, right? You were probably expecting lots of like microscope pictures and diagrams. And I promise they're coming. <laughs> they're in there. But to start off, I just want to do a, a few little introductions. So it's important to us, and, and this is going to make you a better gardener, by understanding how pollination and flower structure help result in the maturation and actual fruit development on plants. If we don't have a good understanding of this, it's going to be hard for us to shoot towards these goals in our own garden. So for example, zucchini or squash plants, um, their blooms, they're obviously developing into fruit, but there's a lot that has to happen before that. Um, the first blooms that appear on a cucurbit are often male flowers. And so they, they're only, the only service they provide to that plant is to uh, preliminarily draw pollinators to that plant so that when it does put on female flowers, um, uh, the pollinators will be present and will be able to move that pollen um, and create a fruit. We're going to talk more about that later, but just a short introduction. Also, we want to get a good understanding of how plants respond to their environments. Um, this is a picture of a plant that has sun scald. It was a small transplant. It wasn't hardened off properly. And so that um, introduction into its environment um, was not done properly and it resulted in a scald. And we're going to talk a little more about that. So understanding the physiology of a plant. This is a picture of a grass lawn. Doesn't look super exciting. But if you do not know if this grass is a cool season grass or a warm season grass, you will not be successful in, um, in fostering the health of that turf in your lawn. So we're gonna uh, talk a little bit about that, understanding physiology of plants. Next, we need to understand the transition of plants from vegetative to reproductive processes. So for example, this, that we're looking at right now is a lettuce plant and it is beginning to bolt. So that means it's trying to go into flower. However, uh, lettuce, obviously, we want to harvest the leaves of the lettuce. We don't want it to create a flower because when it creates a flower, that signals the plant to create seed and die, and then we don't get any more leaves. So it's important for us to understand how to control those, those uh, life stages in a plant and provide environments that will be conducive to keeping that plant in the life stage that we want it. Um, another one would be understanding how plants move water and nutrients through the plant itself. Um, and we're going to get into talking about, you know, xylems and phloem and how, the, how these different uh, things move throughout the plant here in a little bit. Finally, um, it's going to help you be a better gardener by understanding the connections between plants, insects, and the environments that they live in. Um, Many plants have specific pollination processes. Some require other certain plants to be in their presence in order to have successful pollinations. Others require specific insects and some can do it all on their own. So we'll get into that of course as well. So that's just um, uh, hopefully a little bit of a teaser to get you really geared up and, and interested in how we are gonna be able to put some of these um, principles into practical practice in the garden, okay? And I'm gonna, hopefully, to keep you hooked, we're gonna introduce a, a technical principle and then I'm gonna introduce a practical way you can apply it in the garden. And we're gonna follow that format from here throughout the end of our discussion today. So the first section we're gonna tackle is plants anatomy and function, okay? This is where I told you we were gonna talk about what? roots, stems, leaves, and flowers, okay? So this picture here in the background of this slide is actually um, a microscopic picture of a rosebud that has been uh, sliced in half. And so what you're seeing here on the outsides, the little pink areas, those are the petals, right? The rose petals. On the outside of that, that green, those are the sepals. And then you get inside and you see uh, the beginning development of anthers and pistils. 
So I just thought that was kind of a neat little picture to put in there to um, get us started talking about uh, plant structures and biology. So I don't want to take you back to like sophomore, I don't remember what grade we were in high school and we went over all the parts of the cell, but we're going to discuss cell biology in about 15 seconds. <laughs> so uh, cells, these, the functions of plants are why we care about cell biology, right? So thank goodness we're not going to go into all these today, but let's start out with an introduction just to some basic cell parts. Um, and then you can follow that down the rabbit hole in the future if you decide that that's the area you want to learn more about. <laughs> so essentially, we are going to talk a little, I want you to know what these parts are. A vacuole um, and the cell walls, they provide rigidity to our plants, okay? So that is a major function, plant function that they provide to our plants. Chloroplasts obviously um, help with photosynthesis, right? <laughs> And then our mitochondria, which are also important, they store our genetic materials. So um, that is, as far as we're going to go into that, um, the nucleus obviously is the brain of the cell. Okay, that's all we're covering on that. <laughs> and the next thing I want to do is kind of limit our discussion. That's really broad. You're probably thinking, how are we going to cover all of that in one talk? Well, the answer is, is that we are going to limit our discussion tonight to flowering plants only. This means vascular plants, okay? Plants that have seeds, not spores, um, and flowers that contain reproductive structures. So these distinctions separate flowering plants, um, what we call angiosperms, from gymnosperms or conifers, um, and many other plants out there, mosses, ferns, um, I'm trying to think, um, the things that hang in trees, bromeliads, um, they're, the list goes on and on, though so it's wide open, but tonight we are just going to focus on flowering plants, and in broad general terms, Flowering plants can be divided into two categories, monocots and dicots. So in every section that I cover, well, not every section, probably we're going to talk about it mostly with stems, leaves, and flowers. I'm going to be giving you some notations on uh, the characteristics of monocots and dicots for each of those plant parts, okay? And then by the end, we're going to do a fun little thing with that. So be taking notes. Go ahead and make you a column. Dicots. Make you another column. Monocots. And we're going to be writing some things down as we go along. So this is our foundational plant part reference. Okay. I'm going to go back to this slide several times throughout the discussion. Um, I do want to go ahead and point a few things out of importance that we're going to focus on. So our apical bud is the area right here at the very top of the plant. We're, like I said, we'll go into more discussion and have pictures of actual plants uh, with this later. But just for simplicity, this is our apical bud. When we come on down the plant, can you see my little pointer? You can't see my pointer. Let me turn my, I think I can turn a... Uh, like a laser thing on. Let's see. Here it is. Okay. So this is our apical bud here at the top of the plant. We come on down and when you come into the axle, this would be the intersection between our main stem and a, a leaf blade that's coming off. This is called um, an, well, an auxiliary bud or an axillary bud is what we most often refer to it. An axillary bud, that is what um, comes in the leaf axis right there. We have um, internodes, which is the area between nodes. <laughs> and I, uh, so for example, right here where my cursor is, this would be considered a node. Right up here would be another node. So this area right here will be considered an internode. Okay, now here's another one. Here's a node, here's a node. This area right here will be called an internode, okay? Um, so those are some of the important things I wanted to tell you about. And then of course you have 
um, a whole nother thing that's happening down here underground. We've got um, our primary roots, our root hairs, which if you didn't know are um, the root hairs are actually what take up the majority of the water and nutrients from the soil. So they're super, super important. Um, lateral roots and our root cap um, which is where we have most of our meristematic um, root activity happening, cell division, cell elongation, and things of that nature. So that's just a general overview. So we just got started and we're already going to have a plant part pot quiz. Okay, so this isn't testing knowledge I've already taught you. This is just a fun interactive way for us to introduce um, some of the different parts of plants and to get us talking about it. So I think everybody knows how to use the chat box. So what we're gonna do is I'm going to show you a picture, for example, this. Then I'm going to give everyone 15 seconds to think about the answer, think about uh, is this a leaf? Is this a root? Is this a flower slash fruit? Or is this a stem? Okay. And some of them may be trick questions. And good, I, I see already that some of you are putting things in the chat already. But I want to try to do a, a neat little thing. It's called a waterfall. So I'm going to show you the picture. You can go ahead and type your answer in your chat box, but don't hit the submit button until the timer runs out and then everyone's answers will show up at one time. Okay. So it's okay if we've already kind of uh, missed the boat on that one for this first one, but we'll, we'll try it out for the others. So here we go. Here's a picture. You've got 15 seconds. Is this a root? Is this a stem? Is this a fruit or a flower or a leaf? And I want to see the chat box. So let me find that. Good. Okay. Everybody's getting it in there. Our timer ran out and we put it up there. Good, 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 good. Root, 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 root. Okay. So I started y'all off easy. I think we got a hundred percent on this one. All right. Now that was a gimme. Everyone knows this is a carrot. The part of the plant that this comes from, it is actually a root. It is the root. Okay. It's a tap root to be exact. I don't know if you remember the diagram we were just looking at, but it had tap roots, it had lateral roots, root hairs. This would be considered the tap root, okay? Next one. Oh, well, there's the answer. Roots. They're roots. <laughs> Next one. Okay, you've got 15 seconds starting now. Is this a flower? And we're actually looking at this part right here. This is what we're looking at. Okay, your time's out. Hit enter on your on your chat box. Let's see what we've got. Where does my chat box keep going? There it is. Stems, stems. Good. Runner, good answer. I know some people put leaves. That was before I told you <laughs> what part we were looking at. Good, 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 good. Okay, so we've got some stems going on there. We think these are stems. And if you said stems, you would be right. This um, is actually a strawberry. And what we're looking at here is the crown and stolons, actually. A crown um, is the part of the strawberry plant that emerges from the soil. And it is actually a compressed stem. So we have specialized types of stems, just as we have specialized types of flowers. Um, so your crown is a compressed stem. The stolons are also modified stems. A stolon is an above ground uh, runner, is what we call it in a strawberry. Um, and you may be more familiar with the term rhizome, and I don't want you to get the two confused. A rhizome is a modified stem that runs under the ground. So I'm trying to think like Bermuda has stolons and rhizomes. They have modified stems above ground and below ground. Okay, good job. Okay, next one. You have 15 seconds. Is this a flower? Is this a stem? Is this a leaf? Is this a root? What do we think? 
Hmm. Okay, let's see some answers. Where do y'all keep going? There you are. Flower, flower. Some say leaf. Many say flower. All right. Good, so I've caught you in my trap. I tricked you. <laughs> I was being a little trickster on this one. So this is actually a leaf or as we would call it here, a brat because it is a modified type of leaf. And I guess I could go ahead and give those who said flowers a little credit because flowers are in the picture as well. So the white part of, of what we're looking at here is what some would commonly referred to as the dogwood's petals, um, is not. Those are not petals. They are modified leaves that we call bracts. Now, these green parts here in the center, those are actually the flowers. Each one of those is an individual flower. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's probably like 30 flowers in the center of those white bracts. So I will have to give partial credit for those who said flower. Wink, wink. <laughs> All right, let's see. What, what's up next? Here we go. This looks like eggplants, right? We all know these are eggplants. Are we looking at fruit, flowers, stems, or roots? You've got about 10 seconds left. According to my super sensitive countdown circle. <laughs> All right, fruit, 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 fruit. Good, good. I think we're all in agreement. Oh, one person said root. You were trying to trick us. <laughs> so we've got, um, yes, you would be correct in that this is the fruit, this purple part. Now, uh, this part right here, this is actually the sepal, which we'll get into in a little further discussion when we talk about flower parts. This green part is the sepal and this is the fully developed fruit. Okay, fruits and sepals. I think I have, I think there's one or two more of these before we get back on track here. So these are Irish potatoes. All right, what do you think these are? Fruits, stems, flowers, leaves or roots? What do we think they are? About five seconds left. And waterfall. Okay, root, 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 root. Lots of roots, lots of root answers. You should know by now that you can't count on me to give you the answer that is the most obvious. These are actually stems. Irish potatoes are not roots, but rather they are modified stems called tubers. Well, to be more exact, we should call them tuberous stems, okay? There are several different types of tubers. We could have tuberous roots, we could have tuberous stems, um, or just tubers in general, but here we're gonna be calling this a tuberous stem. Each of the eyes on this potato is actually a bud. Do you see these eyes right here? And as we would expect, where do we generally see buds? Think back to our basic diagram of plants. We find buds on the stem, right? Coming from the axillary junctions and also coming from that apical bud there at the top. So, trick ya. <laughs> I think, oh, here, we do have another one. Good, here we go, this is fun. This is purple cauliflower, in case you were wondering what it is. It's a real thing. They've bred cauliflower to be purple, apparently. Is this a flower, fruit, stem, leaf, or root? And waterfall, let's see what we've got. Flower, 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 flower. Good, good, flower, flower, flower. Good, <laughs> y'all are catching on. You've caught my drift. It certainly is a flower. Um, as a cauliflower plant, just as a, um, is growing, 
Um, of course, it is not a leafy crop like lettuces and things of that nature. So we do want to encourage it to go ahead and grow an inflorescence. And that inflorescence does indeed become our uh, cauliflower there. Now, if you tried, if you left it and you didn't harvest it and you allowed it to continue progressing, it would bolt and send up these funny little things that eventually create seeds and it would not taste very good at that point. It gets real kind of like woody and lignous. And uh, this is the point where you want, where this plant would be edible for, you know, our, our all intents and purposes is during its flowering stage right here. Oh, I put more of these in here than I thought. Okay, this is another one. <laughs> this is fun. It's too fun to quit. Okay, we're looking at kohlrabi. Do you think kohlrabi is this, the white, this part right here, is this a root, a leaf, a fruit, or stem? And waterfall. Let's see what we've got. Answers. What do we have here? Root, stem, okay. We've got some different answers. Root, stem, root, stem, root or stem. Good, good. So I'm, I'm getting y'all thinking and, and using those deductive reasonings. So actually that white part of the kohlrabi is actually a stem. Again, it's a modified stem. It's an enlarged, condensed stem. And that is the part of the plant that we eat. I promise this is the last one. <laughs> if it's not, we'll move on. So we're looking at poinsettias right now. Okay, this is a huge grower house of poinsettias. Are we looking at roots, stems, leaves, or flowers? Roots, stems, leaves, or flowers? Let's see what everybody has to say. Leaves, flowers, leaves. Leaves, 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 leaves. Good, most answers are leaves and those who said leaves would be correct. Again, this is very similar to the dogwood that we looked at at the very beginning. Um, they look like the flowers or the petals, but they are actually modified leaves in this case that we call bracts. And the flower is much more subtle. And it's very, very small. Um, and it's in the very center of those bracts in uh, at the top of, I guess what you would call the apical bud there in the top of that, in the top of that plant. So good job. And I'm gonna tell you what this one is. We call it ginger root, but believe it or not, it's not a root at all. Could you imagine it? also is a modified stem. So hopefully this has everybody kind of uh, stretching, stretching the legs of their brain and kind of really thinking about plants and um, what parts of those plants are doing, um, are doing for those plants. So with that being said, we're gonna jump right in. We're gonna talk a little bit about roots right here. So there are different types of root systems. We have tap roots like we discussed with the carrots. Another example would be radishes here or even turnips would be considered tap root type plants. Um, and fibrous, fibrous root plants here on the right. Um, I know that I have lots of like vegetable references. <laughs> in here and I tried to work in some woody and herbaceous stuff, um, but actually uh, Dr. Natalie Bumgardner um, put together uh, the kind of uh, basic uh, presentation and then I went in and modified it. So we have a lot of vegetable influence because she loves the veggies. Um, so roots at a glance, we have the zone of maturation, which is this upper zone here, the zone of elongation. And then remember how I pointed out that root cap before and mentioned that that's where all of our um, cell elongation and division happens. And I have a really neat picture of that that I just kind of wanted to show you all. This is a, a microscope picture and you can see all of these individual cells and where all that meristematic growth is happening in that root. Just thought that was kind of a neat thing. Wanted to share that with y'all. All right, so there are some applications, obviously, <laughs> that we can focus on as gardeners. Um, edible roots, uh, transplanting, inoculation, um, and, and many more. So for example, this right here, 
This is a cucurbit seedling. Not sure if it's a might be a pumpkin, a watermelon, cucumber. They all look pretty similar, but they do. They have very, very tender root systems when they're young, and they do not handle transplanting very well. Um, when you move them, those root hairs tend to break and get damaged, and they just don't survive very well through transplant. And that is why um, we, as gardeners, um, have best success when we are direct seeding those types of plants into our garden. Um, so it's a good thing to know. A good way to make us better gardeners. There are some plants that have nodules on their roots that can actually fix nitrogen. Um, this is a picture right here. Those plants are called legumes. Um, there's a rhizobium bacteria um, that they possess and they're able to pull nitrogen from the atmosphere and make that usable, uh, a usable nutrient for the plant itself. Ooh, this is one of my favorite native wildflowers and they're very, I, like, you don't find them very often in nature. And uh, it's called the yellow lady slipper. And this picture was taken in the, in the Smokies. I think Natalie actually took this picture herself. She and some friends do a lot of hiking up there. But um, the majority of these native wildflowers that we find out in natural areas do not survive well after being dug and transplanted to a different area because they have symbiotic um, relationships with fungi and beneficial bacteria in the soil in their native environments. And when we disrupt that, um, they just don't survive transplantation very well because they are now missing those very important components to their natural ecosystem. So those are just some things uh, that I want you to be aware of and just know that they're out there. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit more about, we're gonna talk about stems. We're moving on from roots, we're going to stems. Again, we have our basic uh, diagram of plant structure here. And um, I just kind of do a little review here. All the tissues in the plant originate from a meristem. I know I was saying that before with roots and we we're talking about elongation, but I don't think I like plainly said that, that that's what I mean when I say meristematic activity. I mean, that is the origin of plant tissue, okay? That's where it's all happening. This is the primary growing point for a plant shoot. And that would be right up here, the apical bud. Before I already showed you, most of that meristematic activity in the root is happening down here on the root cap, right? So it makes sense that the majority of that activity would be happening at the opposite end of the plant as well, at the ap apical bud. Um, let's see, every growing shoot ends in a bud called a terminal or an apical bud. Um, you can use those terms interchangeably, just depends on what material you, you're reading. Uh, some people call that a terminal bud. Apical buds differ, differ from auxiliary buds because they are not in the leaf axis, is what, which is what we talked about a little earlier right here, this axillary bud. That's what makes it different from an apical bud. I can't remember which slide we talk about this, so I'm just going to go ahead and mention it now. So in your apical bud, there is a hormone called auxin that prevents lateral growth from the buds that are beneath the apical bud, okay? When you remove your apical bud, it takes away that auxin and now allows for elongation of these um, lateral or axillary buds. So then you get branching, okay? So taking the top out of a plant can increase branching. And I hope a good example of this would be, um, a good one for you all as beginners to understand is coleus. When you pinch the top out of a coleus plant, it causes branching. That is the perfect example of auxin uh, removing auxin from that um, meristematic growth point and encouraging growth of those other buds. So um, here you can see the apical meristem, which is what we were talking about just a minute ago, right here at the very top. And then here, these are axillary meristems right here. 
I just thought that was cool. Natalie put that in there. She has a lot of microscope stuff. All right, so here's another good example. If we're talking about tomatoes, um, I don't think I put this in my bio, but I actually truck cropped tomatoes and sweet corn among a number of other various things, but those are my two main crops um, from through high school and college to pay for school. Uh, my dad has done it since I was very, very young. And then my siblings did it as well when it was their turn to go to school. Um, so I know quite a bit about suckering and tying some tomato plants, okay? And the tomato plant is the perfect plant to talk about um, apical dominance and axillary buds. So when you have the top of your plant, hopefully you know what the, the top of your tomato plant looks like right here. This is what we call an apical bud or a terminal bud. This is the top of the plant. This is where the growth is happening. This is where all new growth, all new plant tissue originates from that top, okay? Now, the next picture shows an axillary bud that has begun to grow, okay? So this is the stem we were just looking at and the axillary buds up here. Don't be confused because every axillary bud that begins to grow, guess what? It creates its own apical bud. Okay, see now you've got a new little tomato top right there. It's its whole other plant. If you pull this sucker, this is what we call a sucker on a tomato. So you can see the leaf going out that way, the leaf stem. This is your main stem. This is your axillary bud that was allowed to develop. And now it has its own apical, apical um, terminal bud there. You could pluck this off and stick it in the ground and have a whole nother tomato plant. So I just think that's a fun way of, of showing those concepts and hopefully uh, making that make sense to, to some folks that don't have a lot of experience with it. So lots of applications in the garden. We just talked about suckering in time, uh, tomato plants, um, also pruning and pinching plants. So here is a great example. Of, of how we can use this um, in our pruning. So say this is your stem. What's at the top? Our apical bud. And these would be considered axillary buds. I know I don't actually have a stem, a leaf coming off there, but let's just go with it, okay? <laughs> so we want to remove this apical bud and remove the oxen to encourage growth of the lateral buds, okay? So if you come in right here and make the cut here, your axillary bud is on the left side of that branch. So you're gonna get growth that is encouraged to the left right here, see that? And we are talking about woody plants, so that's another thing. However, if you don't want growth of your plant going out to the left, you would rather have new growth coming out to the right, you can go down to the next uh, axillary bud and make your cut there. And now you've encouraged growth out to the right. Now let's look at the bigger picture here. So let's think about directionality of our cuts. Think about a rose bush, for example. I, for those of us who maybe, I don't even know if, it, does anyone still grow hybrid roses? I do. I've got hybrid tea roses and floribunda roses, and I know a lot of people are getting away from that, but they require some pruning. And I like to, to be very open. I like my canes to be open. I like to have good air circulation so that I don't have as many problems with disease, okay? So in order for me to do that, every time I make a cut, I make that cut so that the bud that is immediately below my cut is facing the outside. See, so I make a cut here and then this bud grows to the outside, okay? So I do that for all the canes that are on the left side of the plant. All the canes on the right side of the plant, I follow the cane down until I find an axillary bud that's on the right side. I make my cut there and then it encourages a growth out to the right. Um, so hopefully you're kind of catching my drift of how we can use apical dominance and, um, and the removal of those apical 
bare stems and the removal of oxen to encourage growth um, and control growth in the fashion that we want it to. This picture here on the right would be an example of if you did the opposite. Say that you had a plant that you really wanted to keep tight and columnar um, because, you know, that suits the the structure of your garden or you really wanted that really tall formal feel or maybe you had a rose bush that was kind of getting a little too big and there's a sidewalk right there and you don't want to encourage um, growth out onto that sidewalk. You want to point that growth back uh, towards the inside of that bush. You can um, use these same principles to, um, to achieve the things that we want to see there in our plant growth. Uh, some other ap applications for, um, for stems as a gardener is dwarfism, right? <laughs> right? So if we have smaller internodes, uh, spaces between each of those um, axillary nodes, if those internodes are shortened, that results in a natural dwarf. So sometimes we select for short internodes. Um, we can also control internode length um, through the environment. Uh, plant, it's their response to the environment. So generally, if we have, um, if you have highlight, that encourages short internodes. If you have uh, cool temperatures, that encourages shorter internodes. So if you have low humidity, that encourages shorter internodes. I think I have that one right. <laughs> um, so the plant here on the right, these are both two tomato transplants that were started at the same time, but they were grown under different conditions. Okay, it's the same cultivar, it's the same everything. This plant on the right was held under uh, higher light intensity and <clears throat> higher light intensity and cooler temperatures. And that created a very dense, compact plant. The plant on the left um, did not have as high light intensity and it had warmer temperatures. And you can see how much longer those internodes are. And so we have, you know, a leggier plant, which in this case, this plant still looks healthy to me. I wouldn't exactly call that leggy. Um, but if you've ever tried to start seedlings indoors and you've had issues with legginess, um, try increasing your light intensity um, and possibly reducing temperatures because we may be overcompensating. So this can help us a lot as gardeners, having good understandings of how these functions work. So let's talk a little bit about what's in a stem. Uh, stems contain xylem and phloem. This is the vascular tissue essentially of, um, of our plants. <clears throat> xylem and phloem is not only in stems, it's also in the leaves, right? So we have to transport things through the stems. We also have to transport them out into the leaves. Um, they would be reminiscent of like veins essentially in humans. So if we have, um, if we have a dicot, which I said, remember, you've got a dicot column and a monocot column. If you have a dicot, the xylem and the phloem are arranged in a ring with cambium in between. I'm going to show you a picture in a minute, so don't freak out if you don't understand. In a monocot, the xylem and the phloem are in small bundles in, in the pithy tissue of the stem. So let's think dicots this is a simple way that I usually use to help people. When I say monocot, think of things like grasses. When I say dicot, think of things like anything that has an actual like broad leaf. You know what I mean? Like broad leaf, not a blade type leaf, but a broad leaf. And we'll get into it more as we go along. So some big differences. Dicots have xylem and phloem arranged in rings. Monocots have xylem and phloem in small bundles in their stems. Their arrangement is different when we get into the leaf, but in the stem, that's the arrangement that they follow. So xylem and phloem carry different things and they carry them in different directions. Xylem transports water and minerals and it moves things up through the plant 
through the roots, through the stems and into the leaves. Um, and then actually out of the leaves through transpiration, transpiration pulls that um, moisture out of those leaves. This is a really cool picture. They have put, um, I don't know, it kind of maybe it looks like a, a Swiss chard leaf, I believe. They've split it down the middle and they put one half but they left it connected at the top. They put one half in blue food coloring and the other half in like a red food coloring and then allowed the vascular system of that plant, the xylem in that leaf, to take that dye up and really demonstrate how the vascular system in that leaf is functioning. And I've done this same project with kids with um, like white chrysanthemums that we bought at the forest. It takes a while, so it's best to do it if you're having like a day camp. You can do it first thing in the morning. And then by the afternoon, you can see it streaking through the petals. And it's really a, a fun way to um, get a good grasp on the concept of what xylem does for a plant. Um, <clears throat> this is um, an elm tree, a picture of an elm tree. And this is a disease that we commonly refer to as bacterial leaf scorch. You can see how the ends of the leaves look burnt. We call this scorch. This is actually caused <clears throat> by um, a bacteria, obviously, it's a bacterial, <laughs> called Xylella fastidiosa. Okay, so this bacteria attacks the xylem of this plant. And the Xylem carries water up, right? It carries it through the stem, it carries it through the leaf. Well, when you mess with that system, the moisture can't get to all the places in the leaf that it needs to go. And essentially the water cannot reach these farthest tips of the leaf, okay? A leaf tip is the farthest point of the plant away from the root system where it originally took up that moisture. So, here you can see how um, when you mess with the vascular system, the xylem specifically, um, you can see that displayed through different diseases in plants. Okay, now phloem on the other hand, transports sugars, amino acids, and hormones through the plant. And we typically say it has a downward movement, which it does, um, but in reality, it can actually go both ways. It just depends on concentration. Um, and you see these little, um, these little dividers right here and how they have those little holes in them. So it's all about um, concentration and where that needs to go. But for the most part, yes, it does move downward. Phloem moves sugars, amino acids, and hormones down through a plant. This was a picture, a good example of phytoplasma uh, affecting the, the phloem. This is a small lettuce plant that has been infected, impacted by a pathogen, and that particular pathogen affects the phloem, just like the, the picture before was a bacteria that affects the xylem. Um, this is an, another pathogen that affects the phloem. So because the phloem moves more than just sugars, okay, um, it ended up, it also moves hormones, right? It ended up affecting and causing distortion of the leaf um, because it wasn't allowing proper flow of plant hormones to go to the leaf. Hope I didn't get too deep on that one, but essentially that's, I'm just trying to relate some of these practicalities to things that we see happening in plants. Okay, you remember how I told you we were gonna see a diagram of that cross section of monocots and dicots in a stem. Well, here is exactly what I was talking about. So we have monocots, things like grasses, things that um, have blades, their leaves are blades. They are arranged in a vascular bundle. Think of it like a straw, okay? So each one of these uh, little dot, well, each one of these little circles here, um, think of it as a straw that has two compartments in it, okay? Or just think of it as like two straws stuck together, I guess, side by side, and they're, then you wrap tape around them. <laughs> That'd be a good example. <laughs> so you have phloem and xylem together, okay, in a little bundle, just a little vascular bundle right there, and they're just running up and down, up and down, okay. In a dicot, 
think of like a tree, for example. This is where the example of a tree would come in helpful. In the center of the tree, we have heartwood or pith, correct? Then we move on out. We have xylem right here. Xylem is moving those nutrients up, up the plant. Well, not nutrients, it's moving water up the plant. Well, and nutrients, water and nutrients up the plant. Then remember how I said in dicots, the xylem and the phloem are separated by a very thin layer of cambium. That would be this black line right here. Cambium is where tissue generation happens in the stem, okay? So from the cambium, growth happens inward, like xylem, and then also happens outward towards the phloem. So this final layer here is our phloem or bark, okay? So imagine that your tree is growing, all your growth is originating from this cam that thin, thin cambium layer. As the xylem grows on the inside, it gets bigger and the phloem cracks, right? Yeah, it does. And so think about bark and how we have all these different bark patterns on trees. Um, that is why bark looks the way it does is because growth is happening to the inside of the cambium layer and it's also happening to the outside. So um, it can't, the bark can't stay the same size. It has to have those fissures and allow for expansion and the creation of new bark, okay? Uh, another good example of that is how we have exfoliating bark on crepe myrtles, okay? As that trunk grows, as the diameter of that trunk grows, um, the outer layer, the phloem, the bark sloughs off and new is created. So some practicalities help you get your head wrapped around it. Some other monocots. This is another one of those microscope, microscope slides that I just think are super cool. Some other examples of monocots. Corn, you know, corn is a grass, essentially. So obviously corn is a monocot. Bananas, basically, are monocots. Believe that. <laughs> Daylilies. Iris. Let me think of colocasias, like elephant ears. Um, these would all be considered monocots. So what do these have in common? Let's, I know we're not at leaves yet, but let's just think about it for a minute. They all have parallel leaf veins in them, right? So when you look at a blade of grass, the veins run parallel to one another like this. When you think of a daylily blade, they all run parallel. Same for iris, right? So that's another identifying factor. Monocots are gonna have parallel leaf venation. Now, um, you remember I was giving you those examples of the dicots earlier and we use mostly woody plants to give those examples. Well, obviously there's a whole world of herbaceous dicots out there as well. Um, essentially any of your perennials that are in your garden are going to be considered herbaceous dicots. Any plant that has a broad leaf, um, a broad leaf, leaf, <laughs> doesn't have parallel venation is going to be a dicot, okay? Um, what else? We're going to skip through that. We're running out of time. Okay, we already talked about the exfoliating bark, so I can go on through that. Okay, so let's talk about a few other applications for this in the garden. When we talk about grafting, this is super important because uh, to graft a plant is um, to take two parts of a plant and put them together <laughs> and hopefully they will grow, right? Well, you must have a scion wood, which is the plant that you actually want. And then you have um, rootstock, which is the plant that you are putting your scion onto, okay? We pick rootstocks for all different types of reasons. They Some rootstocks can offer us um, dwarfism, some can offer disease resistance, some can offer hardiness. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of stuff to go in when we get into the world of grafting. But what, what I really wanted to drive home is that when you match up those grafting cuts, it's super important that we get the layers matched up 
the cambium layer especially, because that is where new growth occurs, right? So if when we line up our two cuts, if, if we don't line them up perfectly, so we get them off just a little bit, then we wrap them up, we hope they're gonna heal themselves over. If those layers aren't lined up well enough, you will never have a successful graft and that graft will not take um, because the new growth can initiate. It doesn't have anything to grow onto if those growth layers aren't matched. So that's very, very important. Um, don't know if you knew it or not, but there's a whole world of tomato grafting out there. And I'm sure Natalie, Dr. Natalie Bumgardner will be with y'all and she can fill you in on all the cool things that happen in the world of tomatoes. Um, but uh, we already talked about some of the, the benefits that we can have from graft unions and using those uh, disease resistant roots, root stocks that can provide lots of things in the vegetable world like resistant stuff, fusarium wilt, what else, like southern blight, um, root knot nematodes, bacterial wilt, um, they have root tomato root stalks that can provide resistance to all those, so wonder, what a wonderful full world that would be, disease uh, free tomato plants, and then I wanted to put a picture in here just so you knew what I was talking about, this is our root stalk you can see where the graft was made. This is what we call the graft union. And it usually, it looks like, it looks like, uh, I don't want people to mistake this for an unhealthy plant. Because if you're at the store, you may say, well, that doesn't look exactly right. Well, that's just where the graft healed onto the root stalk and it kind of makes this little U-turn and it becomes the apical, um, the apical bud, right? So it replaces dominance of that root stalk and that scion begins to grow. So just wanted to throw that out there a little bit. What time? We've got about 10 minutes. I'll keep going. And you said we take a break at about 7.20. So about, about 7.20. And Celeste, if, if you have a few moments, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah. Uh, so let's go over a couple of those. Yeah, let's do those. Okay. Uh, one was about internodes, and the question is, if plants are a little leggy and you place them outside in high light, will that cause too much stress on the plant? Well, it depends on temperature, and it depends on, you know, what type of plant it is. Right. So when I say increase light intensity for seedlings, basically, I mean, let's lower our grow light. Does that make sense? So uh, say that you're starting tomato transplants and they're looking like they're getting leggy, drop that grow light down a little bit. Um, or if you're not using a grow light and you're just trying to use incandescent light, get a grow light. And that could be, it could be LED or fluorescent. It just shouldn't be incandescent light. Incandescent light, it just doesn't do the job. So try providing a little supplemental light in that form uh, to shorten up those internodes. Okay, good. Uh, the next question was about bacteria leaf scorch. And okay. Mr. he has that on his dwarf ornamental orange tree. That's a greenhouse plant. And he's asking about the treatment. And what I like to say, first of all, is we need to make sure that it is bacteria leaf scorch. So it'd be good to have a picture there, Mr. Steve, uh, because the next comment was from Ms. Pat. And she was told that oaks, if they have bacteria leaf scorch, uh, it is deadly. Uh, to the tree, and that is true. Uh, you yes. keep that tree as comfortable as possible. Uh, it would need to be watered on a regular basis, uh, even fertilized, and you may have to do some pruning as well. Uh, but uh, over the long term, it's actually a slow death uh, for the most part, especially on your pin oaks, because we have a lot of pin oaks in this area that have bacterial leaf scorch. So that was this question of, uh, was about bacterial leaf scorch, Celeste. And um, all those, I agree with, with everything you just said. Um, and in the landscape where I see actual bacterial leaf scorch is usually on pin oaks. Yeah. That picture that I showed was on elm. I have never seen it personally on an elm. I do see it most often on pin oaks. 
Now, I see scorch in general on lots of other landscape plants, but that doesn't mean it's bacterial leaf scorch. So like I see it on Japanese maples Mm -hmm. late in the summer, Japanese maples that get quite a bit of sun exposure. I always get calls on that. And you see that scorch, that burning right around the leaf margin. And in most cases, that, um, you know, people said, well, it's been raining a lot where I have irrigation, you know, it's not dry. The issue isn't the absence of moisture. The issue is the speed of transpiration. So that plant is releasing moisture to the atmosphere faster than it can absorb it through the roots. And that causes scorch. So uh, maybe that's what's happening in that in this particular situation. With right, you. and that's a good point, Celeste. Real good point. Uh, and let me see what else is there. Okay, so we have uh, 10 minutes until the break, Celeste. So, yeah. Okay, yeah. so we'll go ahead and, and do leaves. And yeah. I think I can do leaves in 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, some of the basic functions of leaves that I want us to cover, obviously, are to collect light. <laughs> Um, to carry out photosynthesis. So this was a good segue into talking about photosynthesis and um, and transpiration there. So good. And maintaining water balance. Okay. So leaf basics. Now this diagram is straight out of y'all's handbook manual. So you have this in chapter three. Don't get too caught up with all of the the words and whatnot, but what I do want you to get a good um, feel for are what stomata are, where they're located on the leaf, and what they do. So stomata are little bitty openings on the bottom, the underside of our leaf surface. Okay, so we on the top, we've got our epidermis, and usually this has some kind of like protective, like layer on there. Some plants have more of a protective layer than others. Say, for example, like a, think of a magnolia leaf, how thick and waxy it is. So it has a really thick epidermis that is um, holding water and moisture into that leaf. Others are not um, as sturdy in that respect, but the stomata are going to be found on the undersides of those leaves, okay? So if you take this and you kind of zoom it in, we're looking right over here now. The stomata is this little area right there, okay? It's that little light green area right here. On either side of the stomata, we have what are called guard cells. And those guard cells have the ability to close up the stomata or open up the stomata, depending on what that plant needs. So if we have a super, super sunny day and say we have high wind and the wind is blowing over that leaf surface and it's removing moisture at a very fast speed, those guard cells can swell up and actually close the stomata. And then that does not allow moisture to leave that plant or that leaf essentially. Um, So it's trying to preserve itself. That's a preservation reaction, okay? Then when conditions become more favorable, say, say it's nighttime and photosynthesis isn't happening at nighttime because there's no sunlight, um, but that plant, now that plant can have a sigh of relief and it can do some transpiration. It has the ability to shrink those guard cells, open up those stomata, and allow gas and water exchange from the surface of that leaf. So stomata is super important. This is a really fun thing to do. I know I keep talking about fun things to do with kids, but you know, I got two little kids, so I got to keep them like interested, you know. Um, (laughs) So you can take a clear fingernail polish and paint it on the underside of a leaf and then let it dry real good a couple hours and then come back and very gently peel it off and you can see the stomata the polish went down into the stomata and then when you pulled it off like you can see the little protrusions on that thin layer of clear fingernail polish so that's a cool cool thing to do um, in case you didn't believe me that they were actually there Go home and try it tomorrow. <laughs> okay. This is another one of those 
uh, neat microscope pictures that Natalie put in here for us. Um, and just wanted you to be able to see how that actually, how those guard cells work there. I think I could just print those off and use those as, as um, beautiful art, right? Forget botanical illustrations. We're going with micro, microscope slides. <laughs> and this is the same thing. Uh, well, it's trying to show the same thing, but in dicots. So a little bit of a different structure here. Our vas You remember how I told you uh, that our vascular system was arranged differently in the leaves than they were in the stems, right? So in the stems, a dicot or a broadleaf plant, they're arranged in a circular pattern, right? So you had the uh, pith and then you had the xylem, then you had the cambium, then you had the phloem, so on and so forth. When you get into the leaf, they're arranged a little differently here. And this is what this is um, showing us here, right here in this area. This is where our vascular bundle is. This would be, if you were looking at a leaf and you flipped it over, see this little indention there? That's a quote unquote vein running through that plant. Imagine that you're, it's hard to explain, but take a leaf, take a, here, I need Piece of paper. Pretend this is a leaf, okay? And then you cut it this way, and this is what we're looking at. <laughs> we're looking at this edge that we just cut. That's what's in this slide right here. And so say that your leaf vein runs straight down the middle of that leaf. See how it makes that little indentation right there? This isn't the greatest. I wish I was in person. See how this is mirroring what we're seeing in the slide right there? Right there. Okay, cool. I hope you can see that. Um, this is showing how our vascular bundles are arranged in monocots or bladed plants, right? So our leaves that are blades like grasses, bananas, corn. Those vascular bundles are still held tightly together, right, in a row, okay? So this should be um, an indicating factor to us that our veins are all parallel, right? Because if we're looking at the cross section, I'm making you, I'm drawing you another picture. So if you're looking at the cross section, like we're seeing right here on the slide, here's the cross section. Now imagine those tubes going straight down that leaf. You've got parallel venation, okay? So just kind of wanted to hit that home. Got a few more minutes here. We'll talk about some applications. Obviously we've got edible, uh, edible plant leaves, you know, Natalie had to throw that one in there with the vegetables. <laughs> we've got many different types of modified leaves that we've already discussed some of earlier in our discussion, and then how they can actually adapt to their environment. So here we've got some pictures of um, kale and mizuna leaves, obviously edible plants. Uh, this is a new picture for us. So believe it or not, this is a modified leaf. This is a pitcher plant, okay? It's carnivorous and it catches insects and then eats them. <laughs> well, it dissolves them, okay? And it uses the protein and the nitrogen that it derives from those um, decaying carcasses to help supplement the nutrients that that plant needs because it's usually found in some uh, pretty poor growing environments. So a pitcher plant, this would be an example of a modified leaf. This is not a flower, this is a leaf, okay? The fly or insect is attracted to the mouth of that pitcher because it smells really bad. It puts off kind of a something's dead kind of smell, <laughs> which it is because there's other dead insects in there. And it flies and it hits the, it hits like right underneath here, and then it falls down into that tube. So modified leaf for insect catching. Some other examples would be cactus. Cactus have modified leaves. Those are the spines, right? They're for protection. They're trying to conserve all the water that's inside their um, plant body. And so their leaves have been modified into spines for protection. A few other things that I feel like people 
might not realize. So there's lots of plants out there that have like a silvery texture to them and they're almost furry to the touch. Um, those are actually called trichomes, those little furry things that you're feeling, and they have a purpose. They help the plants survive um, harsh environmental conditions, whether that is excess light or heat or protection from wind. And those little furry trichomes, um, let me think of some examples like Dusty Miller, um, Lavender even has that kind of um, Though it has trichomes on it. Lots of Mediterranean type plants that have that gray cast to them. If you look very closely, they have trichomes on them. And that makes sense because it's a very arid condition, growing condition in the Mediterranean. Um, okay, so bringing it all together. Respiration and photosynthesis, we've talked a little bit about that already, but they are essentially mirror images of one another. And I feel like this picture is really confusing. <laughs> There's a lot of like words and arrows and lines. I like this better. It really, you know, I know people learn different ways, but this makes so much more sense to me. So think of this as a formula, okay? We have carbon dioxide plus water. We add sunlight, which is solar energy, and that is photosynthesis, okay? So we have the plant taking in carbon dioxide and water. We add the sun, that's photosynthesis. Photosynthesis produces glucose for the plant and it also creates oxygen. It releases oxygen, right? Plants give us oxygen, okay? That is photosynthesis. Now, if we think of respiration, it's the exact opposite of photosynthesis. And I'm not lying, I'm talking like it's the exact opposite, okay? So it takes some of that oxygen that the plant created, it breaks down the glucose that the plant generated to help fuel itself, okay? It, it takes some of the oxygen, it breaks down the glucose, and it releases energy in the form of heat, and that is called respiration. Okay, and then the plant gives off water and carbon dioxide. So I hope that this helps you understand, you know, when, when your people start throwing out these terms, you're not really sure exactly what's going on. Just always remember in your head, photosynthesis uses energy, respiration gives off energy, okay, in the form of heat. This is kind of a little neat example, but um, I live on a cotton farm. We raise beans and wheat and corn too, have, but have lots of cotton right here around where I live. We, I've done this experiment so many times and it is always true. I will hold a thermometer, like a temperature thermometer, right? In my yard, I'm standing here in the yard, say it's, you know, 98 degrees because it's like smoking hot in the summertime. Then I'll walk out into the middle of that cotton field with the same thermometer and take the temperature again. And the temperature always rises at least four degrees, okay? And that's because all those plants that are surrounding me are releasing energy. They're all breathing. Um, so that's just kind of a neat little side note that I wanted to share with you all. So that wraps up leaves. When we come back from our break, we'll talk about flowers. All right, and one last question, Celeste, before we do go to that break. Uh, would all succulents be modified? Yes. yes. Or, well, the majority of them. I hate to say all. I mean, that you can't ever say all in the yeah. plant world. <laughs> um, but the majority of them, yes, would be considered, they are modified leaves because their modification is for storage, right? Uh, that's why they're fleshy, because um, they, they're storing moisture basically. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's take a, let's, let's take a five minute break. Let's get back at 735. So yeah, stretch out, uh, go use the restroom. I eat some of those vegetables that Celeste was talking about earlier. <laughs> All right. See y'all in five minutes at 735 and we'll get started. Back. Okay. You're right back. All right. 